So my name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Show Me the Money, Monetizing Data Management. This year's October edition in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Let me give the floor to Megan Jacobs, the webinar organizer from Data Blueprint, to introduce our speaker and today's webinar. Megan. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Megan Jacobs and I'm the webinar coordinator here at Data Blueprint. Uh, we are pleased that you found the time to join us for today's webinar on Show Me the Money, Monetizing Data Management. As always, a big thank you goes out to Shannon and Dataversity for hosting us. And we'll get started in just a few moments after I let you know about some housekeeping items and introduce your presenter. A one-hour presentation followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as questions time allows, but feel free to submit questions as they come up through the session. Now to the top two most commonly asked questions. Yes, you will receive an email with links to download today's materials and any other information you request during the session with the next two business days. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We set up tag dead on Twitter, so if you're logged on, feel free to use it in your tweets and submit your questions and comments that way. Um, we keep an eye on the Twitter feed and will include answers to those questions in our post-session email. So let me introduce you to our presenter. Uh, Peter Aiken is an internationally recognized data management leader. Many already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Uh, Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He's written dozens of articles and eight books. That's nine books now. The most, is, um, the most recent is uh, Monetizing Data Management. His experience with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Uh, some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his and Data Blueprint's expertise. Uh, Peter spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. He is at conferences and is constantly traveling. Peter, where are you, where are you at this week? It's in an undisclosed location in a hotel room somewhere, Megan. It's the first time I've actually had to say that. <laughs> so uh, we'll jump right in here. We're real excited today because this is a uh, literally finale for this book. We weren't sure we were going to get this thing done. And I want to give a shout out to Shannon, of course, as well. We'll head up on the website uh, shortly so you guys can hopefully uh, get a copy of this and give us some feedback on it. But this book was literally finished on Friday, and it was up on Amazon on Monday. Uh, so it's wonderful to be working with a team uh, who's able to put this type of thing together, and I appreciate everybody who's been helpful in that process. Uh, I called it monetizing data management. Luckily, I have some very smart marketing people who work for it. Yeah, that's a nice topic, but you really need to call this Show Me the Money. Uh, in addition to that, you should have seen the cover I was going to put on the book, and this is the cover they came up with. Uh, again, thanks also to them. Also, thanks to uh, Juanita and uh, John Bottega for uh, their contributions to this as well. It's just been a, a real fun fun exercise working for this. Uh, a little bit about what I'm doing and, and what's going on on this topic, but more importantly, I also want to invite all of you listening out there to share stories of this type. And there's a forum for sharing those stories, and there's something called Enterprise Data World. It's a conference we run every year in conjunction with Dataversity. And this year it's going to be in a really fun place, Austin, Texas. Uh, so it's one of the better parts of Texas, and uh, we're just so looking forward to it at the end of April. And the reason I'm mentioning it right now is because the call for papers is out there right now. And this is how this process got started with people submitting stories, coming sharing their experiences, and helping everybody to become smart about this entire profession. So if you have trouble funding it, just quit EDW to 014 on web, and you will find uh, all kinds of hits on how to get there and uh, make your own contribution, or you can ask us some questions, and we'll come back to that after the end of the presentation. Uh, do for all of these things, we start them all out with a data management overview just to make sure that everybody's on the same page literally on this. And then we're going to talk a little bit about book motivations and survey results, and I'll look at some specific examples of, of 
well, we've really got to change our, our, our talk about this because if you ask people what you do, and I manage data, it sounds like you're an accountant. Um, I don't mean that in any disrespect. I've been one for many, many years. But if you tell them leverage data, they kind of get interested in that. And if you think about it, we don't manage data for the sake of managing data. We manage data for the sake of leveraging it. So if we start to think with the end in mind, or as Louis Broom, who's our CEO, always says, give them the why first, because that will allow them to really understand the motivation of, of what we're trying to do. Uh, I'm going to dive in, and I'll try to get in six quick very cases on return on investment and two cases for non-monetary ROI. Uh, in this case, it turns out saving lives is also important to some organizations, so we'll talk about how data management has helped out in that context as well. Finish up with a little bit on some legal considerations. Uh, and of course, as always, we look forward to the Q&A and takeaway on this. So let's get started. We always talk about data management as being five integrated practice areas as shown on this chart here. It's a very difficult chart. We don't expect anybody to get it, particularly management, right off just because it's a lot of material to absorb. But the, the real key to take away from this chart is that these are five interlocking chain links. And if one of the chain links is broken, non-existent, or weak, the entire practice area can only be as strong as the weakest link in the chain. The five chain links then are managing data coherently, making sure that we're all singing on the same sheet of music, that we're working to the same effort. And yet when we go into organization after organization, we find really dedicated people that are working in work groups, not at an enterprise level. And oftentimes these work groups are working at competing uh, purposes for these areas. And that's kind of sad because it means counteracting your efforts taking valuable organizational resources and not using them effectively. And we have instances where companies have gone out of business for bad practices in these areas. Second chain, we, excuse me, the second limited chain is organizational data integration. This is the idea that in your organization, whether you are sharing data from a program to another program, from the marketing organization to another part of the organization, perhaps manufacturing, or whether you're sharing data between your organization and other organizations that are your business partners. That data sharing is typically not done in its most effective and efficient fashion, and consequently there are savings that can be done in that area. And again, all strategic leveraging that can occur as well. Our area is data stewardship. We've long time ago that if we didn't make this personal, if it doesn't say, Peter, your next raise depends on you improving the quality of this data by X, Y, and Z, uh, you know, measurable amount within a certain period of time in a, in a very discernible fashion, uh, then it becomes everybody's problem and nobody actually does anything to it. This is what started the entire data governance movement. And again, 10 years ago, we might have been talking about data governance. And people would have kind of looked at us funny. Now we have entire tracks at Enterprise Data World devoted to governance and governance. There's, in fact, an entire conference uh, around that occurs twice uh, a year. <clears throat> our fourth function, our fourth link in the chain is data development, and this is the idea that we need to engineer specific data delivery systems. In the past, and unfortunately, the colleges and universities of the world have taught people that the answer to this question is the relational database system. It is certainly part of the answer, but it leaves out a lot of other pictures, including virtualization, portals, XML, and all sorts of things that we now call big data techniques. Uh, in there. Finally, our, our last area is data support operations. This is the idea that we do need to maintain the availability. It's not like a car. Uh, excuse me. It is like a car. You need to be able to drive it off a lot, but you need to replenish the fluids occasionally, change the tires. We can't simply let it run. It is something that requires active, proactive participation so that our data assets will be supportive of our organizational strategy. Now, we talk at the same time about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if your food, clothing, and shelter needs are unmet, it's very unlikely that you'll be doing self-actualization activities, whether that includes a musical instrument or um, some lines of writing a great American novel or whatever it is that you do for self-actualization. And data management, it is no different. The data management practice areas that I've given you up to this are necessary but insufficient prerequisites 
prerequisites to all the really self-actualizing fun stuff that goes on in organizations. These are things like master data management, data mining, analytics, uh, warehousing, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, if you're going to do something in that green triangle, this actualizing triangle, you can do it without the benefit of the five data management practice areas if you're willing for it to take longer, cost more, deliver less at greater risk to the organization than if you instead learn to crawl, walk, and run your way up to the goal point. So that's our first little overview just to make sure everybody's on the, the same page. Again, love to cover the book on this. What we're going to do uh, as, as part of this whole process is help us in the community better articulate what it is that we do and why it's important for management to pay attention to it. So the last two books that I've done have been short books, less than 100 pages each, in hopes that we can communicate this information to people who are very busy, who are smart, talented executives who don't know that they don't know something, and more importantly, they don't know that their IT people also don't know something either. What that means is that we have very smart IT people and smart executives making very poor decisions about data, and that is a problem for many, many organizations. We'll divide it up into four parts. First of all, uh, the one is about this practice of leveraging data. Then I present 11 financial cases, five non-monetary cases, and a section of legal practices and IT uh, objects in there in order to do this. Now, we've said several times as we were leading up to the start of the seminar today, and Shannon was helpful and, and sent the link out a couple times, we do a lot of research at Data Blueprint trying to find out what's actually happening out there. And one of the questions we've asked in our survey is this one. These are preliminary results. If you haven't had a chance to take the survey, please do click on the link below and go ahead and take it right now because we're trying to get to statistical significance over the statistical significance point. So we ask questions here. It says, how does your organization define value? And you can see that in our survey results, customer satisfaction seems to be leading the edge with profit and followed closely by quality. Then we ask the question, what's the most important goal for your data management projects, and you can see that is a learning of organizational capabilities. 80% of the organizations have cited that as a very key piece of information. Then we have improving efficiencies and then alignment with strategy as our third uh, piece in there. I've actually got an academic paper that addresses that in a little bit more detail. If you'd like to learn more about it, just ask for it at the end. We'll make sure it's included in the packet that gets out after the webinar. Another question, what percentage of your data management projects are successful uh, in there? And the question was, were 75% of them successful? 30% of the people said yes. 50% of them successful? 27% said yes. Were 25% of them successful? 20% said that. So we do have a challenge around our data management projects, and we want to try and get better about them. <clears throat> Unsuccessful data management initiatives, what were the reasons? Failure, lack of organizational maturity seems to be a 70% uh, category in there. Advocacy, which means you can't just start the project. You have to keep working on it. You have to keep pushing something that my colleague John Ladley calls sustainment around the life cycle of the project. And 40% of you said lack of alignment with business goals. So, again, these are, are good pieces of information. We'd love to get some more. From, uh, so again, please do do this. We will be putting out a white paper, and if you're interested in the results, you can register at the survey, and we'll be good to get a copy of these results to you, and hopefully be able to participate in future efforts. Uh, again, question about funding. You can see that's just sort of hard because to show value, there isn't a precedence, or again, there doesn't seem to be as much problem with saying these data projects need to be aligned with business objectives as well. And then we have a question about data-centric thinking, and I'll explain what that is. Specifically, 70% of you said no, 30% uh, of you said yes. Uh, so to the survey results that we have for you in a preliminary fashion, we will publish the actual results when we get it all the way up. Let's take a minute and take a look at what we mean by data management first. And I always ask groups whether they know what the number 42 is. People say oh, that's the Jackie Robinson's uh, Jerry Wright, great movie on that. And certainly it's an icon uh, in that. If you go back a little further in history, there was a great book called Dust Adams Psyker's Guide to the Galaxy, and 42 was the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. So if you've gotten nothing else out of this webinar, you now know what the meaning of life, the universe, and everything is. And what I've just done is I've combined a fact with meaning. 
The fact 42, the meaning is the meaning of life. Uh, 42 is my age 12 years ago. That may not be relevant to you, but it's a different fact and therefore a different piece of data that comes to play on that. We'll now start to look at what we're trying to do from a delivery perspective, how pair data with requests, our anticipated requests for information, and it now becomes a higher level of, of a construct here. The information is a, a more refined concept than specifically just the data. And if we get to intelligence, that's where we really get smart about it because then we've looked, we've observed the cycle, and we know how to strategically use the data. Now, my point in describing this structure here to you is because it means that we have an architectural construct where the necessary requirement of putting data together for that information in order to get to strategic use of it is necessary but an insufficient condition. This also then leads us from an architectural construct into a in construct. And leverage, I've mentioned it several times so far, data leverage is an engineering concept. If we take a very large object object on the left-hand side of your screen and make a very, very, very long lever, a very small human being can move a very large amount of bulk with a per set of engineering concepts. That's what we're trying to do with data. What that means is that data leverage is specifically an engineering concept, which most people are not trained at. So take that bulk and replace it with our organizational data add people to the process, the organizational data managers that are working on this. And we then complete our triangle with technologies, the lever as well as the fulcrum that we have here, add a process to this, which is that we shouldn't try and pull a lever until it's properly set in place. We can now start to see how data engineering starts to move mountains of data for organizations. One additional piece on this particular chart as well is the concept of rot. Most data is redundant, obsolete, or trivial, and if we reduce the amount of rot, our leverage increases. Management is critically important today because it leads directly to ineffective use of manpower, money, methods, as well as machines. And as I mentioned before, we have real problems in the educational area where we teach new students how to build new systems. Most of our work is not about building systems, and the last people we would put on new systems development are inexperienced young people. We're teaching them incorrectly in the college and university system. Business thinks we're taking care of this because we call it IT. One of the things we try to do with our customers is to, to convince them that unless there really is an I component in there, most of what they call IT is really just T. Now, there's another very important point to this too, and that is that data development activities are different from system development activities. I'm going to show you a specific chart on this here, which is to say that our system development activities are fundamentally oriented around creating capabilities where capabilities did not exist. However, our data is a different process, and instead of being a creation-oriented activity, it is an evolution-oriented activity. So our rule here is that data evolution is separate from kernel 2 and must precede system development activities. In fact, I have a rule that if you can't tell me how many existing data elements your new development activities are going to reuse and how many new data elements need to be created, you don't have a good idea of what your data requirements are on the project and therefore should not be spending any money on that project at all. The reason for this, again, is because we've built things and told people we've to build things incorrectly. We start out and say strategy, and you heard about the alignment pieces earlier on in this hour. We talk about strategy, which leads to goals and objectives, and a very natural step is let's make some systems that come out of that. For systems, then we start to develop networks, and data becomes an afterthought. Let me make a very specific example here and say that the system that we're going to put in place is a software package. So we buy the software package, we buy a network to support the software package, and at the end of that discussion, we have a question on what data does that software pa package need, which is a very different question from what data do we need to support our strategy. 
problems with this approach are it absolutely guarantees that the data is going to be formed around the applications and not around organization-wide information requirements, that the processes are narrowly formed around the applications, and there's little data reuse as possible, we end up with a situation like, like this. If you follow the typical application-centric development path, these applications end up with their own stovepipe of data, which is how it is in your organizations. And when we try to connect them, we end up with a wonderful web, but guaranteed to keep somebody employed, but certainly not the best way for us to approach this. A quick pause here. And I'll talk about the alternative of centric development. In this model, let's see, first objectives occur. We have strategy and we want some goals and objectives, but instead, next, of going to define the organizational information requirements. These organizational requirements then drive the network infrastructure components, which finally drive system and application efforts. I can see we have saved organizations really millions of dollars in buying the wrong software because they didn't understand their data requirements. Once you understand your data requirements, you can then determine whether the systems that you're being asked to evaluate, in fact, meet and complement your organizational strategic objectives. Following this approach, this data-centric approach means that the data and information assets are developed from an organization-wide perspective. That the systems support the organizational data needs and complement the existing process flows, and this gives us maximum data and information reuse. If you go and look on the web at the reason, the primary motivation behind object oriented has been software reuse. And outside of a few narrow constructs, such as families of software and operating systems, software is not being reused. What happens it isn't being reused is because we don't have good ways of plugging it and understanding it. And it turns out those are the fundamental attributes of data. So we should now put our time and attention into reusing data. Also, I hope that you can see on here as well that the pathway from data information to systems and applications that I'm showing on the right-hand side of this chart are the things will leave cleaner systems design all the way around. If you're able to obtain cleaner system design, it means they're easier to maintain and easier to put together. And now we can finally achieve the process of some of the wonderful technologies in that green triangle I showed you before, such as service-oriented architectures, et cetera, et cetera. This leads us to our first polling question. Those of you that have been on these seminars before know that our ongoing quest for knowledge, we want to ask questions. And one of the questions we want to ask you all is, who in your organization makes the decision to invest in data management initiatives? Hey, guess what? I get to vote on this one. So we're going to take a minute here, uh, actually 50 seconds, if I recall correctly from Chance Guidance, and ask you guys to take a quick look at this. Oops. Keep that out here. I'm going to try to vote. Whether I do it or not. I think I can vote. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> First time I've seen that pop up. We have a few seconds left and get everybody's responses in. All right, have all the results in. Let's see. Oh, okay. So, Office yeah. of the Chief Data Officer, Enterprise Data Office equivalent, 31%. IT and supported by the business together is 7%. I'm sorry, I'm reading it wrong. Okay, never mind. Starting with the top, you guys can all see the results. IT, uh, business area, 10%. Both of them together, 30% is the way it should be. Not enough in there. Good. Well, again, thank you for participating in that. Again, we're using this as an ongoing process to try and figure out how we help everybody in the community get better about what we're doing. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm going to briefly go through these cases. Each of these cases is in the book and uh, in much more detail. And of course, when we get to the Q&A section, we'll be very happy to, to explain them in more detail. But here's a situation where an organization was looking at how much time was spent by various associates of the organization doing time and leave tracking. 
And we did in this, we took the number of employees, which is on the Y axis here, and we took them by district in this case, and looked at the specific pay grade. So one of the things you can see is that there are two grade 13s that are spending time, uh, actually it's more than two, uh, spending time and leave doing clerical type functions. And in the Lynchburg district, there's a, a grade five that has a lot of people doing it. We were able to come back and say authoritatively that at least 300 people in this organization were spending 15 minutes a week doing time and leave tracking. So what can I do with that information? Well, instead of going around and finding out their actual salaries, I can get the base level salary of a grade 15 multiplied by the number of 15s that were doing this, the base salary of a grade 5, and figure it out. This means that I can put together some to look like this, which is to say in District L, 73 people were doing time leave tracking, 50 people were doing time tracking. We can put in the cost of these timekeeping. We can come up with a semi-monthly cost of $21,000 and monthly cost of $137,000, which means when I went to add them all up across the entire organization, I came up with a total that it was very close. $10 million annually. That's a tremendous amount of money for an organization to spend. And we have to ask the question, is there in fact a better way for the organization to do this? Now, contextually, this occurred within a general organizational systems rethinking. And one of the things that they did is they used this information to make some cost-benefit trade-offs and said, how much time do we actually benefit from these people do this type of activity? And can we make this activity to a point where it doesn't cost the organization tens of millions of dollars annually? So again, very quick sort of warm-up case on this just gets us to $10 million. Here's another one that takes to $25 million. Now, our here, it's a billion-plus dollar chemical company that does fuel additives to enhance engine performance, helps the fuels burn clean, smoother, and last longer. And they run tens of thousand tests annually that cost up to $250,000 a piece. This was kind of fun because when the team went into this particular organization, we told them they might have to wear lab coats, and they were immediately thinking medical procedures or something like this. And we said, no, we don't want you to get oil on your clothes because when they talk about testing engines, they take the engines downstairs and they turn them on and let them run. And it comes up with a marvelous set of uh, requirements in here. So when we look at these data management practice. I want you to picture a room full of uh, uh, chemical PhDs, and each of these individuals are getting paid six salaries. These are really smart scientists who really do understand what it is they're doing and how they're adding value to the organization. And yet, in spite of the brain power in this room, we found instances where these PhDs were taking digital data from computer system number one and around and rekeying this information into data system number two. Now, any of us on this call could have absolutely figured that one out for them, and it didn't occur to them that there might be a better way in order to do this. So we ran into many instances where we were doing manual file manipulation, where they were duplicating data. They were taking synonyms back and forth. They were requiring tribal knowledge. And most importantly, they were using what we call non-sustainable technology. So again, you can see we highlighted each of the instances that we're looking at here. Now, I have to tell you, right here, the organization said, wow, you can stop. You've already earned your money because we've never had a good window into what our people actually did as they were researching these chemical compounds and things like that. So they're grateful just for the chart. But when we told them also, again, that they were doing this and using a database that hadn't been around, that had actually not been used, was not manufactured, was not supported for a long time, they realized the significant amount of risk they had in their organization. And led them on to a conclusion that they said, you know, maybe this isn't the best way to go out doing this. We did this process for them. We really came up with a measure that showed that their knowledge workers, these chemical and PhDs, were spending approximately 80% of their time doing work that had been done by somebody at a much lower set of pay grades, and more importantly, by somebody who was a specialist in this area who could do it more effectively for the entire group. So instead of the entire group of 100 of them trying to do all this collectively, 
very poorly. We added one more person to the group who was expert at this, who was able to increase the productivity of the group in a rather dramatic fashion. In fact, because we're 80% unproductive and 20% of their time was actually devoted to analyzing these chemical compounds that were the strategic needs of the organization, we only had to make them 60% unproductive in order to achieve an actual doubling of their productivity, which went from 20% productive time to 40% productive time. They told us that this year after this, this was a $25 million imprint in their productivity. And they look at these results, they were able to reduce expenses, improve their competitive edge, and, and clearly left money on the table in this case, because I guarantee you we didn't charge them $25 million uh, in order to come up with this. Again, quickly on this, but uh, hopefully this is going to make sense for you all. This is a vocabulary discussion about the word tank. Now, you might not think that tank is a critical word, but it turns out that tank is kind of important. And here's a scenario. There's a company who's into you can petroleum requirements, where the tank will come from, and they bought a an accounting package. An accounting package that they purchased treated every transference of petroleum product from one tank to another tank as a retail sale. Now of you are going, okay, that, that's really not the way it works because we have a lot of things that occur in the petroleum manufacturing process before we get to the final sale. Faced with this, the company had to make a decision of what to change, to alter, to customize the accounting package that they were looking at in order to make it work well for them or imply a form of data governance that fully controlled the vocabulary around the word tank. Now, let me do a very brief analogy. Many organizations have a customer as a concept. We need a blueprint absolutely avoid try to make our, so our clients avoid using a concept as generic as customer. Because customer doesn't get to the nuances of what a customer is. A customer can be a current customer or a former customer. And you don't want to make the same communications to your current customers that you would to your potential customers or former customers. For example, you wouldn't want to tell your current customers that the thing they bought yesterday is now on sale. And yet that might exactly be the message that you want to send to a potential customer. The controlled vocabulary is a very important thing. So alternative one, this oil company could have changed, customized, invested heavily in custom this accounting package to work well for them. Second option, the one they chose, was that they said we will control the vocabulary in a tank using proper governance. In other words, this tank tank represented retail sales. However, this tank didn't represent a retail sale. Neither this tank or this or tank or this tank. Oh, wait. That's a completely different type of tank entirely, isn't it? We'll come back to that tank in just a minute. So you can see that the vocabulary solution allowed these organizations to save millions of dollars of work customizing the software that had to be applied to the software every time the manufacturer upgraded, released a new version of the accounting software, and that occurred minimally every single year. So again, controlling the vocabulary around tank, this organization from the horror of having to get into customizing accounting package and kept them from confusing the various types of text so they could know what was a retail sale, what was a retail sale, and perhaps more important, what was not the tank of the type that they were looking at. One more item, this fellow is tanked. We won't go any further than that. But, but let's move now to another story. With a branch of the armed forces buys heavy equipment. In that I'm showing a tank. That one tank also comes with three million plus new pieces of data for the organization. That's interesting. That's a lot of information. 
information. And just out of curiosity, how many of those pieces of information do you think control the obsolescence or lifetime, the useful lifetime of that heavy equipment? And if you don't know the answer to that, you tend to treat all three million values of equal importance. However, as you'll see in the next slide, if you are maintaining obsolete equipment, clear some of those values are more important than other values that are in there. So organization, by imposing good data governance around their tanks, in this case a different type of tank entirely, we're able to look and see that they had, in fact, five billion dollars for equipment that, in fact, be obsolete, which meant that during times of war, the five billion dollars could be based in some place into a set of operations that were much more valuable than maintaining things that they couldn't even use eventually. Now, large organizations have all kinds of problems like this, whether it is tanks, whether it's heavy equipment, anything that's a depreciable asset in many cases is subject to this type of analysis and understanding here. And just getting this process in place allowed the organization to see that not all of their data were equal. Of the three million values, there were clearly some that were much more important than others. And understanding which ones were more important and which ones were not, we were now able to find, in fact, a better process for managing these things so that the armed forces, in this case, would no longer house, maintain, oil, spare parts for, move them around, or count on these tanks during times when we had other needs for those particular funds um, and resources. Going to the next example here. A challenge in the organization where they had millions and millions of NSNs, national stock numbers, or SKUs, shopkeeper units that were maintained a, quote, electronic catalog. The problem was that this electronic catalog, while it was in fact a database, uh, just to be perfectly clear, it was an Oracle database that had been engineered to work as a hierarchical database. The reason they re-engineered the Oracle database, which is a relational database, to work as a hierarchical database is because the programs accessed a hierarchical database, and they didn't have to change those programs in order to swap the data out. So somebody told them they'd upgrade their database. They really did, but it was kind of like uh, uh, retrofit. Uh, I don't really have a good word at a perspective, now we need to move into a new organizational package, new software package for this. So this is the next one. The people looked at this and said, my goodness, we're going to have to manually extract this text. Left the data structuring problem unresolved. Uh, you'll hear the terms unstructured and structured data used frequently. We prefer the terms tabular and non-tabular because if you have something was unstructured, that's the definition of unstructured data. You can't add structure to it. Um, so we shouldn't be talking about transforming unstructured data. However, we can talk all day long about taking tabular and non-tabular data and converting them back and forth uh, in here. We called for them a proprietary improvable text extraction process. We'd call this text mining now in this to convert the non-tabular data into tabular. And so then, um, in this case, $5 million off of the original estimate. Now, that's what we're most proud of. The thing that we were most proud of was the fact that this was the first time we had actually saved an organization a per century of work. You've heard of a person year, a person month, or a person day. Here's a person century. Let me show you how we got to these calculations. The first thing we did was out how much we could actually do with our text mining process. Now, the key with automation is knowing when to apply it and when to switch back to the manual process. Here's how we figured this out in conjunction with the customer. We had an 18-week process of which we held the of tan sides fixed, it was the cost of two of our engineers working on text mining process, half time for each week for the total 
amount of time that we went through. When we held that part firm, we were able to see what sort of results we got, and we identify the place at which the organization was experiencing diminishing returns, the point at which the returns were less than the cost of the investment, and that's, of course, the place that you want to stop letting the churn occur. So let's see how we did this. First of all, you can see the first week that we did this, we were kind of bad. We didn't actually match much of anything. And this is a, an important process. You have to make sure that people have an expectation. And we told them it's going to take us several weeks before we fine-tune the algorithm and actually start matching things. But by week four, we had actually matched 55% of the things. We were able to go in, read this clear text field with our algorithms, and extract it, match it up against the golden master, what would be now called master data management attack, and solve more than half of the problem just after four weeks. We also had been able to determine that some of the items in these fields were ignorable, that they had no business value. The first week we had 1%, and that number grew to almost 12%. You're just a hair under 12%. So if you had the 12% and the 55%, we had two-thirds of the problem solved by the end of the fourth week. So the question became not, is this a good approach, which we clearly had demonstrated that, but how much further should we take it before we turn it back over to the manual approach? And here, again, was quite easy. We looked at the unmatched items. And you can see they went up and down a bit as we got better and worse at our algorithms. Now, the process involved ma uh, interviewing the subject matter experts, helping them to help us code up different algorithms, put them in place, and, and apply them. Them. I'm going to head in time here to go to week 14. You can see that the number of unmatched items had dropped from 32% down to 9% of the items. So if you watch nine from 14 to 18 here, we went up a little bit. It went to 9.6, 9.5, and then back down to 7.6. It should have only been going down. And they're doing this, we found errors that had been given to us, and we had coded those errors incorrectly. But we did finally get at week six down to 7.5% of the internal problem space was still unsolved, and that we had by week 14 gotten to 22% of the field containing absolutely nothing of value. So once the data was, in this case, rotten, we're not able to use it at all, and our items matched increased gradually to 69, just under 70%. So again, when you match up the 6922, leaving just 7% of the original problem, this was clearly the stopping point, the point at which we should stop with this and turn it back over to the manual process that was originally supposed to occur. Now, let's calculate return on this investment here. Get a benefit. There were two million NSNs, two million stop keepers unit. And if we put in there an average time to review and cleanse them of five minutes, gives ten million minutes that we needed to do. We then took the time resources available over the year, number of weeks, work days, seven and a half hours per day, four hundred and fifty minutes per day, minutes per year. You get the point. I did it all up and we came up with ninety two point six person years, just shy of a person century on this. Of course, we then apply a measure. This organization valued their SME time at $60,000 a year, $5 million here. Now, one of the other tricks that we do on this is a little bit of social engineering. It hurt to make sure they are, in fact, underestimating the cost of this. Anybody would always point out during one of these meetings, Can you clean these things up in five minutes apiece? And the answer, of course, most of you know, is absolutely not. Five minutes is an absurd underestimate for this. So if we just double that to 10 minutes, we now have two per centuries and $10 million. 15 minutes, three per centuries, and $15 million. Once again, here, hopefully you can see that there's clearly a value to the organization that applying good management technologies, in this case, to this problem, help the organization save millions and millions of dollars and years and years and years of value-added person effort. 
One question on, I'm sorry, not a quick question on this. One more example here real quick. This is a very small investment. And I'll tell you what's going on in this. Britcom was ready to roll out a new master data management strategy. In order to do this, we wanted to communicate the sense of this project to everybody in a clear and understandable fashion. So here's a little bit that they invested approximately 500 British pounds, not a lot of money, and came up with a little flash animation that gave a bit of information to all of their associates. It was sent to them in an email, and they were able to track the number of people who opened the email, played it more than once, and put it. So here's a little thing. I hit the wrong button there. Sorry about that. Let's try it again. Master, that's actually in stereo as well. It's quite, quite, quite music. It's a brilliant little piece uh, advertising what they're going to do. And when they double-checked across the organization, they were able to find out that a lot of people remembered which of the stacks, they remembered a number of the seven stacks that they were doing on that. A great investment in a small amount of coding and animation to convey a very complex subject to a vast number of business as well as technology people. And again, I just think that's a marvelous piece. We have that on our website at Data Blueprint, and we can certainly post the link to that later on afterwards. I encourage you, they encourage us to encourage you to download it and take a look at it and perhaps play it for your own organization and see if an investment like that might also pay off similarly in your environment. So we get to polling question number two. Again, we want to how is it and what types of problems are you running into obtaining funding for your data management projects? So if you'll out by voting on this, it would be terrific. All right, we've got 20 seconds left on the poll. We'll get your guys' answers in and then we'll see what comes out to. And they're all in. Again, some of you are not answering it. Is it because we're not giving you the right choices? Uh, most of you say yes uh, because it's hard to show value. Well, again, that's what we're trying to do here. So please let us know whether these examples are giving you some inspiration or not. 8% uh, of you said yes because we've not aligned with business objectives. 30% no precedent has been set. And Five, you say you have the ability to really demonstrate value, and that is phenomenal. Again, I would encourage you to submit your sessions to Enterprise Data World coming up so that we can get some of that experience and share it back and forth across organizations. Because if you have something out there that we don't know, uh, it's something we'd love to have shared amongst us in the data management community. So thank you again for participating there. Let's talk about a really sad episode occurred in the early part of the uh, Afghan war. The idea here is that our military people are using a device to point out a target that's called lighting up the target. So a hotel room in a non-disclosed location, and if I took my laser pointer and pointed it at a building across the street here, then 
the Air Force that was bringing in the bomb would take that building and drop the bomb on that. Hopefully it's a place where bad guys are and, and that sort of thing uh, is on it. But in the process of doing that, they also double-check themselves. and They have multiple people lighting. There's lots of safety checks and and um, uh, procedures in place to make sure that nothing bad happens as a result of this one. In this instance, and a couple of like it, they had to change batteries on the, one of the units that they were doing. And when they did, the unit lit their own position up instead of the position they had been formulating up, resulting in the bomb dropping on our own troops. Uh, again, they're not well known. It didn't happen a lot, but it's just, in our mind, absolutely terrible that something like this would happen. That data management system was set up where it would lock in on a position and transmit it and then change coordinates without alerting the operator that something had happened. Our smartphones are better than this. Groups have a right to expect in the field that this also will be the case as well. Now, another part of this is that we at Data Blueprint were very fortunate to play a small supportive role in the suicide mitigation project. You all probably know the terrible statistics now that more of our soldiers are losing uh, their to their own hands than they are to bad people uh, doing this. And in the process, long story short, of doing this work, we ended up doing a lot of data mapping and trying to find out where how different data was used for certain things. This is just a notional map. Again, these are actual artifacts from the project uh, that we're on here. And we would end up with these situations where we have a group that we call the Council of Colonels, where we have a lot of people would come into a room and say, you can use my data for this purpose, and you can use my data for this purpose, and my data can be used to help do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they were mostly presented in a, a non-helpful manner. In other words, my data can only be used for this purpose. We were very fortunate in that we had a senior Army official who came into the room in time and said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've heard my data enough, Secretary of the Army, and it's all my data from this point forward. So if you have any questions about that, you are welcome to make an appointment and come talk to me about why your data shouldn't be used to support our troops. Doing more near justice to the emphasis with which this message was delivered. But you get the picture here. This empowered the team, and the conversation turned from can this be done to how are we going to accomplish. It certainly said that mistakes would be tolerated along the way, but it allowed us to quickly put up a prototype. We could start to analyze the various communication patterns from our the armed forces so that we could then try to make early intervention possible that we would again save lives under these circumstances. This is an instance of being your official take charge and saying, you know what, I know that you all think that your day use is important, but there is a strategic use here that we need to do, which is save the lives of our war fighters. And that is going to be our mission, and we're going to do it in a way in which I prescribe. And it made a difference. I have talked to dozens of corporations and told this story and said to the CEOs and the boards of these organizations that if you were willing to make a similarly strong statement, I'd be willing to work on a percentage for you because I can guarantee you if you would take this effort, just as we did here in the military, and save lives, I can save your organization tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, and all I want is 1%, and we would be doing much better off all the way around. But for some reason, and many organizations are reluctant to make this investment in this. And so the question now, again, we ask you all, similar we came off the survey here, is what percentage of your data projects are in fact successful here? Because if you know these statistics internally, then you can go into it with your eyes wide open the next time people try to do this. So again, just very quick, because our last one here is we're headed up to the top of the hour, and I'll tell you one more little story, and then we'll get to the Q&A uh, port of our session. List. Again, what percentage of your projects are successful here? Uh, the clock. Okay, we got about 10 seconds left on the clock, and it looks like most of you guys are getting answers in, so we'll go ahead and get those answers up in just a few moments. Or again. Yes, yes. Seconds. 
we're going to keep you guys on the line here for 10 minutes while we compile the results. No, I'm just kidding. Could have managed for but we're not that good. And they are all in. You should be able to see the results. Again, some of you are just not able to, to give us this information, but 5% successful is the largest number there. Boy, that's so good to get better than that. And again, we hope that these pieces of information will help you to move onward on this. We include these survey results as the uh, final communication here, too. So I'm just going to move on to the next, which is. Just a very briefly, we do a fair amount of expert support here. And I'm just going to tell a little story very quickly. But Company X says we're going to implement uh, – I actually got a directive from headquarters that you need to implement this software package. And they said, well, we'll go to the software package manufacturer and ask them for a preferred specialist who's expert at installing their software in this particular business. Contracted with the preferred specialist. In July, they began implementation for a six-month effort that was supposed to be finished by December 31st, so they didn't have to use two systems in the next year. They realized in January that they had missed the uh, milestone, and the defendant in this case said, well, your data was bad. Now, if you don't make sense of what your data looks like before you let somebody convert it, how are you going to defend against the charge that your data is bad? They had arguments. It uh, went back and forth a bit. Uh, they worked actually another six months on the project and did not solve the project. So when these things go to arbitration in this case, because that's how most of these clauses are, are governed as an arbitration clause, uh, they go through a process of producing expert reports. The questions over who owned the risks, who was the project manager, was the data in fact of poor quality, did the contractor exercise due diligence, did they have an adequate methodology, and were the required standards of care followed uh, in order to do that. Our expert report that we produced for them showed that the conversion code that was used introduced errors into the data in two substantive ways. It showed that the data that converted was of measurably lower quality than the quality of the data before the conversion. We dodged a bullet on that one. The company Y had caused harm by not performing an analysis of the legacy systems were there and had withheld specific information on here. Not familiar with programming, there are objective programming standards that you should use that are published out there on the web by organizations like the IEEE and the Association for Computing Machinery. For example, if I'm reading in source, and this is pseudocode, so don't try and figure out which language this is, it says if column one is an M, then set value of the target tail, else set it to email, that's wrong because it doesn't take into account the fact that other values. So O, Z, and P might be going up, in which case they would all get set to the field, and that would be incorrect. And we're able to show that. We're able to show that all of these data values that they should have been testing for were not, in fact, being tested. And this was governed, in this case, by Canadian law. And this organization was very, very easy to show that they had introduced errors into the code. Similarly, we looked at this, and you can see the this is some PeopleSoft code, so it was a PeopleSoft implementation. And when they couldn't get the data to go in correctly to the data set, PeopleSoft prevents you from adding duplicate numbers into the data set. Now, that sounds a little bit normal. You wouldn't want duplicate records in the database, and PeopleSoft correctly keeps you from doing that. But collectors in this case, when they couldn't get the job to run the first time, dummy the code that allowed these things to go in. So they were adding duplicate records to the data set. So when we looked and said how many records are in there, there were 63,000 records in a place where there should have only been 6,000 records, and 100,000 records in a place where there should have only been 10,000 records. These are unconscionably stupid mistakes for somebody to make, and yet they continued to make them. And this happens in lots and lots of cases that we look at in this. Here's one we identified the conversion data as being very problematic. It was marked as a high risk at the beginning of the project. And risk response, those of you that are familiar with Project Management Institute, says you should develop a response to the risk and monitor for it. And their only risk response was, if it doesn't go in right, we're going to charge you more money for it. So if it didn't work, they actually got paid more money. How's that for an incentive? There's another one where they mentioned that they, the um, project manager was a question as to who was the project manager. And when we looked here, we were able to demonstrate a lot of evidence that shows 
understood that Kang Wai was acting like the project manager, and so there was no question as to who was in fact producing those results. Another piece, again, these are all pieces of evidence from these these instances here. There are a bunch of instances of, of project plans. And we looked here, if you look to the next to the last line, you'll see the largest one. It had almost 500 instances of tasks with only 15 predecessors out of 500 tasks. Again, anything about project management, you know that that is simply not good project management technology or not good data management about the tasks that go along with the project. Or here, finally, is somebody who was charging 2,000 hours to the task of project management and only over allocating themselves by a factor of five. So they're working, instead of 40 hour weeks, they were working 200 hour weeks. All of things are crazy. And, and again, we find them over and over again. You'll see this happen in a lot of cases where if you look at your contracts that are signed by the IT shop, they are warranting that the services provided will be performed in a professional and workmanlike manner in accordance with industry standards. So we ask the question, where's industry standards? Hey, well, I don't know. There's nothing written down. I say, well, if there's nothing written down, then where are them? And they say, well, I, I wouldn't know where to go look for these standards. So in the absence of these precise standards, we're able to apply good data management practices to show, in fact, the organization should be doing this better. So just very briefly, legal situation here, what I've done is I've walked you through time and agency leave tracking with an example that gave you $1 million in data management savings, and in a chemical company for $25 million, an ERP implementation for $5 million, a British Telecom project, very small investment there to come up with it, and then some non-monetary examples that are really problematic as well as our legal example. We are at the top of the hour, and now it's time for questions. So let's see what sort of questions. Well, I've done a good job of enticing you into this, and again, hopefully asking you all to submit sessions to the upcoming Enterprise Day world on this so that we can now start to come up with additional examples so that we can all share from type of uh, uh, piece. And there were a couple of contributed pieces in the book here as well, uh, you'll see as well. So hopefully that will be good. Anyway, we move to our Q&A session. Megan, back over to you. Okay, thanks, Peter. That was a great presentation. Um, it's time for a Q&A. It's time for you all to ask your questions. So just click on the Q&A window it's um, at the top of your screen. Uh, you should be able to submit your questions through that uh, Q&A window. So it's just a minute here so you guys can get your questions in and we'll get started. Again, you think this is going to be available at the Dataversity bookstore, right? Oh, your current book? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to the Dataversity bookstore and get a copy of this. You added it up while you were talking, so we are good. Wow. Go. Shannon, that's faster <laughs> than Amazon. Amazing. <laughs> How about that? We'll, we'll, we'll call you this from now on. You will be faster than Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> that's a <awesome> that's title. <laughs> quite I think it is, yeah. We we had one, one somebody said, uh, you know, your Indian name is the thing you shouldn't do, and there's one here called Runs with Scissors. <laughs> so Shanna is going to be faster than Amazon. Hi. Oh, it looks like we got our first question then. It is, how do you retain organizational attention when other issues rise as being more costly, even if you could make the cost case initially? Great question. And that is one of the things that we have to recognize is that while what we do is important, we have to keep in mind strategy as far as the organization goes. Uh, let me give an example of a company that some of you are probably familiar with. It's a large credit card company that has the, the slogan, uh, what's in your wallet, to give you a little context on that. One of the things they put in place for their data governance uh, is something they called an architecture tax. And there are valid reasons for saying, yes, I understand that this is important and that you should do it this way. However, do you really get paid on Friday? Which is a reasonable question to ask from some, some organizations. Now, don't worry, I'm not suggesting that this organization 
eventually was going to go out of business, but there was a pressing business need that many circumstances that the questioner asked, which is a very reasonable thing. This is important, but sometimes other things are more important. However, from a governance perspective, what this organization did is they said, you can proceed with the project. Absolutely, go right ahead. But we're going to tax the financial results that you're going to get on this project. I'll give you a very concrete number. The business, in this case, needed to raise an additional $50 million annually from this project. And if they could put this project in quickly, it would capture a business opportunity that was a, a temporal business opportunity, but that it would raise an additional $50 million. And they said, that's terrific. We'll be very glad to do that. We'll give you a waiver on the architectural component here. However, out of X for every month that you don't go back and implement this thing correctly. Two reasons for that. One, you'll get benefits, but you won't get all of the benefits. So there's an incentive to problems so that you eliminate the tax and get the benefits of the implementation. And two, tax will ensure that there's money available in this organization to rebuild the system correctly when time becomes appropriate. So very, very good question from the questioner's perspective. Sometimes this stuff is important, but not as important as other business concerns. And part of the question that you asked was, by the way, that monthly tax was what kept it as a important criteria within the organization. Another component, though, and I'm going to go back to the BT example here. Not that one is the only thing that they did. Remember, we this little uh, animation that they had there. But we have seen organizations use this type of communication to talk to people about projects. Now, one of the most important things to remember about projects of any sort if you're not talking about it, someone else is speculating about it. And if speculating, they're making stuff up. And if they're making stuff up, it's probably not the stuff you want to have said about your project. If you start off with a little bit of cute animation like this, just to give that type of thing, but giving a regular progress report in the same format there will actually cause people to look forward to these reports. And if you tell them the truth, our project's going great, but we had to stop it for a few minutes because something else came up, but we're going to get back on track. And then hold to what you say. People tend to trust the things that you come up with from the main office on this. Now, IT hasn't always been as good about articulating these things as it could be. And again, I would encourage you to learn from our marketing group at Data Blueprint. They do a phenomenal job of keeping everybody focused on track. One of the things I do is I come up with lots of ideas, and they go, nope, nope, Peter, get back on score. But they also are very, very good at that communication. So don't just internal to your own group to do it. Go out to your corporate communications group, to your marketing group, and ask them for some help, some tip. Things I urge all groups to do is to keep a website up and running because that website is where people will go to try and get information, particularly if you provide them with a good of information on that. So great question. I hope I answered the question for you. If I didn't, please come back and, and give us another, uh, another crack at it. Right, let's see. The next question is, how monetize conference and making opportunities? For example, what is the best way to show ROI for attending conferences for the networking benefits if you board on through many of the basic course offerings? I, sorry, I'm laughing on this one, but I do about 30 conferences a year, so if I can't figure out how to monetize this one, shame on me, right? <laughs> uh, somebody probably knows me and has put me on the spot with that one. So one is I tie this back into business value, and I'm not suggesting at all that you guys should go to 30 conferences a year. It's a uh, uh, heart, heart and, and mind, believe me. But um, at the, from a training perspective, one of the things that you will see if there's a marvelous opportunity to look at what good companies do. And when you look at good good companies, actually excellent companies, let's go ahead and, and be excellent companies invest in training. And it turns out that most IT people need a couple of weeks training or a couple of events such as what the questioner is asking each year 
it are just to stay current. So you can go out and benchmark your company against other companies. Again, if you work for a teco, you can look at training opportunities for the teleco industry and see that some of them should be teleco specific and some of them should be IT specific. And if the average company producing average results is getting two training sessions a year, then you can make an argument and say that going to three should help. Now, the other part of it is to look at specific training objectives and to say within our organizational strategy, what pieces of the strategy are going to be met by training objectives. For example, I'll go to the uh, angle that everybody likes so much, and I get a lot of uh, people that talk about this. And if we want to learn how to be, for example, good at the things that are these self-actualizing data practices that we talked about early on, right? And we want to learn more about master data management or access mining, to take the example from here. That what's good to learn about those text mining pieces, the question is what business value will text mining deliver to us in the organization? And if it's that we were facing a big legacy challenge, and then in order to meet the big legacy challenge, we wanted to reduce the burden of the legacy conversion costs from a million dollars down to something less than $5 million, then training in how to do text mining could in fact produce that. Again, you can look at an investment in text mining might be uh, somewhere on the order of, of you know, to thousands of dollars instead of millions of dollars. Uh, let me give you a very specific example for data, data blueprint. Um, I've several times, and I usually mention every session that, that we only fully trained and certified data uh, engineering staff of any firm out there, and I, I very much stand by that, and I'm very proud of the accomplishments that we have on that. Uh, we brought in my colleague Dan Lindstadt uh, in the summer, who trained everybody in a data vault methodology. And when Dan does his training, he comes up with specific training objectives. And, and in larger context, a lot of the work that we're doing require beyond data warehousing techniques. You could see that the data vault methodology was something that we needed to learn, that we needed to learn to help our customers learn it, and that Dan provides excellent training in that area. So again, specific measurable objectives, and Dan controls the certification. He grades every one of the essay exams that they take at the end of their training. So it's not a matter of taking a multiple choice test and coming up with a, you know, ticket printed on the end of it, Dan stands by his work and does an excellent job. So I didn't mean to give too much of a Dan commercial there, but Dan's a wonderful guy, and his data vault training is very, very good. And we were able to turn that into a very significant investment, monetizing our own consulting practices in the area. And I hope those are good examples for you. I hope that helps. And if not, again, please ask other questions. Thanks. All right, great. and the next question is, uh, how do you handle pushback on showing monetary soft savings, like pro uh, productivity improvements, um, and soft savings don't always translate to bottom line? So, good question, and I'll go back to this example here. We at how people spend their time. In people, six figures to do a job then you really want to make sure that they're doing jobs that are worth six figures. And taking digital information off of a computing system and annually rekeying it into another digital computing system by finger typing, like click, 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 look at the piece, click, 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 back and forth, is clearly not worth six figures. So it's very, very easy to come with these soft skill measurements in the area. I'll draw your attention to a book that I see in my book as major inspiration. It's called How to Measure Anything. It's a wonderful book that describes that virtually nothing is unmeasurable. And that's the problem. That's why we call them soft skills, because they've gotten this sort of wrap that they are hard to measure. Again, what is the value of training? Well, an HR professional can tell you precisely what the value of training is for organizations in your industry. They can organizations train more, provide more dollars per share, earnings for investment, again, whatever the measures are that you're using in your specific area. And we call these things soft skills because in the past we haven't paid as much time and attention to them as we should, but that we absolutely can 
can drive value, specific tangible value from these soft savings. Remember in this example here, this was not just doing this and saving those people uh, time and effort, but that this translated into improved productivity on the parts of these individuals to the tune of their estimate, $25 million gain in their productivity. So that's a soft skills investment that resulted in a very tangible gain. In this case, they were able to measure it in specific terms of new products entered into the market, improved testing, reduced costs, and finally better organizational teamwork. Because one of the things that happened as we were doing this was that we would find researchers, and we actually had this happen in the, chemo, uh, in the uh, drug, drug chemical industry as well. Uh, but researchers who literally worked next to each other in cubes, who were doing research, and they go to lunch and talk about things and perhaps even commute together, but they never talked about their work. And until they went to a conference and one fellow saw another colleague present a paper, realized, oh my goodness, I'm chocolating, you've got peanut butter, and we've been working next to each other for years, and we never thought about putting these two things together. Uh, so again, a wonderful, wonderful set of examples in that area. We call them soft skills not because they are soft, but because we haven't been as good at practicing our measurements around them. So again, have to measure anything. By the way, there is Douglas Hubbard. Uh, I don't know, Shannon, whether that's on your website, but knowing Shannon is faster than Amazon, she's probably got it up on her website by the time we've finished uh, this particular webinar. Just a terrific, terrific book on how to look at monetizing those particular skills, and I do call it out in the book. Great, and thank you. Okay, the next question is, uh, can you say a little more about how to shift from an application-centric development approach, data-centric or centered development approach? What are key ingredients or objectives to accomplish this shift? So, uh, a great question, and I always should add a caveat here that I didn't today, uh, which is to say that, that while this is an absolutely important thing to do, uh, it can't happen instantly. And you do have to, in fact, take it gradually in order to do that. So let's just review very, very briefly here. The application-centric mix, hopefully it's on screen there, uh, shows that most organizations start off with strategy to come up with goals and they go to what seems to be a very natural step of developing systems and applications. And if you think about it, systems are generally defined as hardware, software, people, processes, and data, five ingredients in there. So people tend to say, yes, let's go do that. But the minute you start talking about, again, we said PeopleSoft several times in this talk, so we'll say PeopleSoft. At this step, conversation becomes about how PeopleSoft is going to do this and PeopleSoft is going to do that, and that we talk about how PeopleSoft is going to help the organization instead of the system achieving its objectives. So what we're trying to get to is data-centric approaches, which is flipping the systems and the data pieces of that and talk instead about the data objectives. Now, just go into your organization and say, stop doing all these projects. You're doing them all wrong. Peter says you're doing it wrong. By the way, you're welcome to Peter says, because I'm one that gets you know, shot for those things, and that's perfectly valuable. That way you won't get shot. Um, so you're going to tell them that Peter says they're wrong. Now, I'll be glad to come and argue with them to say that they're not doing it incorrectly. What we have to do is to look at it. And the bigger your organization is, the easier it is to do. The best thing to do for this situation to implement, that we're doing this in several companies at the moment, is that you say, look, you continue to do these projects the way, should, the way you're doing them now, but let's take a small portfolio of projects and do them in a different manner, do them in this data-centric fashion. Because if we take a significant portion of your portfolio and do them differently, we can now compare A to B and decide whether this is, in fact, the better way to do this. The goal is to let the organization see gradually over time that developing their data assets separate from external to and preceding system development lifecycle activities produces better outcomes. Now, we'll take this very specifically because most organizations are looking at something now called agile. And it was a very good method for improving the productivity of software development. However, if you're in the middle of an agile session and they say, oh, well, we just need another database, that's what you get. Lots and lots of different piles of data in the organization. 
how could it function? So what you need to do is to step back from that process and say the only thing that will speed up Agile in most organizations is taking the data out of Agile. Once the data out of Agile and say that an Agile project should not start until they specify precisely which data elements they're going to be reusing and creating, and if they don't have those two pieces developed, they shouldn't start on the Agile project. Then we the Agile project to go forward once it's met this data governance threshold of finding the government the governance the use of data that they're going to use in there as a part of data governance. So again, the only way we can speed up agile processing is to take the data out, to recognize that data is separate from. This is absolutely different from anything we teach you in college or university. In fact, it's just the opposite of what we teach you. We teach you that the life cycle approach is go off and develop your data requirements at the same time you're doing your processing requirements. And if you try to do them at the same time, the only outcome is this is what we've been getting. And that those pieces and the dash of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I hope that gives you some ideas. Again, it's not everything that you're doing in your portfolio and stop, but take an experiment and let's try this for a couple of these projects and see how it goes. And once you're able to show the organization that projects done in this decentric method are producing better outcomes than projects that are going the traditional way, you can decide what projects meet the criteria into this particular mode of operation. And as you do this, the organization will practice it, get better at it, and eventually you'll have a much better application development outcome. By the way, our estimates show it's 40% cheaper to do it this way. We stand behind very, very much. Great. And the next question is, uh, how do you prevent a program or project from being implemented when your analysis shows that the system systems are involved would critically impact uh, DG data governance, I guess, because of dirty data and the business wants to move forward because it is strategic effort and budgeted for. Wow, that was a mouthful. <laughs> it is, <laughs> and it's a great it? <laughs> No, uh, I've got the sentiment on it, absolutely. Okay. I'm going to refer you to the other book that we did this year. We celebrated in the springtime called The Case for the Chief Data Officer. And the key there is to understand that because these data elements are in fact coming out and the data evolves and it's not created, that is an asset for organizations. An asset, it should have a manager of that asset as strong as your GFO is a physical asset manager. Again, just imagine in your organization, if anybody could write a check for any amount of money for anything at any time, that would be considered very poor fiscal asset governance. Very bad idea for most organizations, and in fact, it's illegal in some parts of the, of the organizations. Our data as an asset is ungoverned. So the first thing we have to do is put somebody in charge of it, because if there's not person in charge, everybody's in charge, which means nobody's in charge. Strong data governance will then proceed and development activities. And there's a chart in the other book that shows that data governance then controls as a gateway function the technology development that occurs. Once you have your data requirements down, technology development can proceed. But if you don't have that, and it requires strong leadership. Again, I wish I could name the corporations that I have stood in front of their corporate boards and said, if you make this step, it would reduce your IT spend by 40%. And a lot of them like the idea of saving 40% on their IT spend, but they're not, they haven't been willing. A few of them have, but most of them have not been willing to say, okay, we'll subordinate our, our programming projects to our data governance function. And yet you subordinate all of your IT projects to your finance function, so why shouldn't we subordinate these other functions to that? I think I gave a very clear answer there, but did it make sense? And if not, please please do ask a clarifying question on that. Looks like we have time for one more question. Um, what if the data-centric development approach 
doesn't influence leadership to step back and stop the execution of the program or project? What is the approach? It's a good question. In other words, we have to manage expectations in this process as well. Now, now one in three IT projects actually succeeds on time with full functionality within budget with risk to the organization. So anything better than those numbers is going to be considered a success. If we're doing this and we're not doing any better, we're not doing something right. And the idea is that we have to be careful about our measurements and our expectations. So just the same as we can't say, what stop the cart, we've got to change everything, we can't do any more systems development until we have our enterprise data model, that's crazy. The organizations aren't going to wait for that. So we manage expectations and say we're going to introduce this project gradually in a series of controlled exercises so that we can isolate the incidents. Are you going to try data-centric development on your most important strategic asset? Probably not. Find something that is of less importance but still doesn't have a good track record. And do a couple of the times to try it out. See how good you get. See if you're, in fact, getting better about it. And then move on to what you're trying to really do, which is to put it in place for all of your projects. Again, carefully manage expectations. Don't go out and say, Peter said, stop and start. It doesn't work that way, but gradually transform. And look for a way of comparing A and B. Because when you do this, the results speak for themselves. And management won't need to be convinced of this because it will be obvious to them that this is a better way of approaching the management of our sole, non-depletable, integrating strategic asset. Okay, we have one more question, and I think we have time to answer it uh, quickly. Um, should data have an asset tag? <laughs> and in fact, any of you that are going, um, there's a, an argument in the book about whether data is an asset or not. Um, so uh, there's actually a, a couple of, um, I've got a couple of upcoming events where I'm going to be arguing with some thought leaders about whether data is an asset or not. And I'd welcome your participation in those events. Uh, so if you want to know more about those, uh, just look on the web. You'll find some things out there that uh, we're going to have some debate about whether data is an asset or not. I think it's, by the way, the, the question comes down to, and I think it's a very reasonable one, you know, is somebody's email address that's only valid for about 90 days really a data asset for the organization? Depends on what you define as a data asset. If information about your buying habits of your customers, uh, that's really an asset. So, Again, I think the answer is yes, the data is an asset, and it should be managed in a manner comparable with your other organizational assets, including your HR, including your finances, including your capital equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it looks like that those are all the questions we have for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in this event. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks to Dataversity and Shannon for hosting us. Uh, once again, you will receive today's materials within the next two business days. Uh, the webinar next month will be Unlocked Business Value Through Reference and MDM. Hope you'll be able to join us for that as well. As always, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Uh, thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Yeah, if you've got some ideas about how to put uh, topics together for this uh, for Enterprise Data World, absolutely, we'd love to see you in Austin in April. So we welcome your submissions. We're actively soliciting them. And Megan, thank you. And Peter, just to emphasize, definitely get us those those patients in. The cutoff date is the 14th of this month, so not much not much longer left. Or almost either through October. I can't believe it. Everyone, thank you so much. And again, as always, thank you so much for your active participation. I love all the questions coming in and everything. And I hope everyone has a great day. And thanks, Peter and Megan, for another great presentation. So did you get that other book up on the website? It is. It's up there. Yep. Faster than Amazon. <laughs> we got a new nickname for uh, Megan. We need a new T-shirt for uh, Shannon. Uh, <laughs> what well, is it? A special one for <laughs> Bye, everybody. Have a great Bye. day.